The first speaker is, uh, is Suzanne Mendendauer. She's from University of Rhode Island. Uh, she works with the Northeast Shelf uh, LTER, uh, which is funded at Woods Hole. Uh, this is one of our newest LTERs. Uh, it was funded last September of 2017. Uh, I'd like to say that they've hit the ground running, but it occurs to me that that's a pretty in uh, explanation for an ocean LTER. Uh, but nevertheless, because they've started in September, I think you'll be hearing uh, more or less the information about the site and what they expect to do going forward where they're starting from so it'll be a little different than some of the LTRs that have had years and years of funding already so Suzanne please thank you can you hear me well I tend to yeah. stay quiet um, I also noticed that in the transition from Mac to Windows there was some reform mining, so it's on the eastern seaboard, not seaboard eastern. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to introduce you to one of the newest LTRs. And as I was thinking, uh, sitting here listening to the fabulous talks and the wonderful insights generated by sustained, persistent observations over years and decades, in comparison, in comparison, we are eight months old, so we are in our infancy. I have two small children, so I think about their skill level. So we're beginning to crawl, or they're really advanced for me to be standing up at this point. My goal today is to introduce you to two, the two major motivators for our LTR. And that is, we live and work in a very historic area. The area has been utilized by humans for, for many, many years in various ways. Our LTR spans the region from the Atlantic Maritime border with Canada down to Cape Hatteras, so right past here in Washington, D.C. And we know a lot about the components of our LTR. We know from lighthouse observations that this is a very dynamic environment. We have great environmental records. We also have records of the components of the fabulously productive fisheries in the region. We know about the microscopic organisms called plankton that drive the food webs. We know a lot about the fish. But what we really don't know is how these components interact to make this wonderful system and make this wonderfully productive fishery system. And that's one of our motivations. And the other is we live in a very dynamic environment. Environmental change is not only the currently, uh, currently induced changes through anthropogenic Forcings, but also the natural variability. So our second goal is to tease apart the roles of different types of variability on the ecosystem function. As I said, people have lived in the area for hundreds and thousands of years and utilized the system, and that goes on today. Rock Island Sound, right smack in the middle of our LTR, is site of the first operational U.S. wind farm, and that shows a new type of resource utilization in the, in the coastal areas. As I said, we have wonderful <coughs> records, and I think some of those are truly unique. We have 50-year records of plankton and fish abundances, for example. These, these kinds of sustained records are unheard of. <coughs> and if you uh, looked at the weather news lately, we live in a very dynamic area. This movie here shows the sea surface temperature from 1978 to today, um, alternating seasonally between warm colors, sort of in the very comfortable swimming temperatures of 25 degrees, to wintertime temperatures where the uh, coastal ocean can actually freeze. And I live in Narragansett, Rhode Island, and that's a tourist destination for about four or five months out of the year because of those red colors. We haven't seen any tourists in the last four weeks when we had three nor'easters and snowstorms in March. Organisms live in this kind of dynamic environment. So we have the wonderful opportunity in a very short time span of a year to observe <coughs> temperature gradients and other environmental change that spans the dynamic range of the surface ocean. The ocean doesn't get much colder than freezing, and it doesn't get much hotter than 30 degrees. We also know that this fishery is driven by a microbial food web that starts with microscopic primary producers called phytoplankton. These are eaten by zooplankton, and which are ultimately eaten by fish. And we also know if that food chain is really short, 
then we get a lot of fish. And we, that food chain tends to be short when the phytoplankton are large. We also, this is work from Caitlin Lawrence's master's thesis, we know that the system is really efficient. And I won't talk you through all the data, but this is uh, the only uh, one year record of really looking at the abundance of primary producers, their growth rates, and how much of that gets eaten by the uh, first trophic level, the herbivores. And what we're seeing is that there is some seasonality, but really year round, the system is very efficient. On average, 94% of the primary production is eaten. So if you have some uh, company producing, uh, producing something, 94% of your product is taken up. You're doing really, really well. So in the strategy of putting our LTR together, we really wanted to look at how does the system that we know that's fairly well described, how do these components interact? We have several hypotheses. For example, that changes in the heat flux, changes the uh, mixing of the water column, which changes the nutrient supply. We've heard about that in, uh, in two of the previous talks. Nutrient supply is, is very fundamental to these primary producers. And we also want to look at sources of variability, whether these are short-term sources of variability, for example, for if you like wine or, or other agricultural products, they're good years, they're bad years. The same is true in planktonic food webs. There's not necessarily a conclusion or a driver in every bit of variability. But we also know that the ocean is on average warming and on average getting more acidic. So we have to tease apart these kinds of uh, uh, factors in affecting our ecosystem production. And what we really need to do is have sustained observations in order to gain a mechanistic and predictive understanding of how food works uh, restructure under different kinds of environmental forcing. And we have, if this doesn't sound complex enough, now we already have records <coughs> that the base of the food web is changing. There were observations now of large types of phytoplankton that are reoccurring after 800,000 years absent in the North Atlantic. These phytoplankton are abundant in the North Pacific, but they were absent. <coughs> Combining molecular methods, stratigraphy, uh, truly interdisciplinary research, we had all found that these uh, diatoms are re-emerging and it seems they're re-emerging because of a lower sea ice cover in the Arctic and probably advection through, um, through from the Pacific to the North Atlantic. <coughs> but even resident species are changing. This is work from our lead PI, Heidi Sosek at Hui, and her lab, where they uh, did this truly pioneering work of the in the 2000s started to instrument the ocean for continuous sustained observations and recorded sea surface temperature, but also uh, recorded the abundance of specific <coughs> types of phytoplankton that are very small and typically not associated with a lot of fisheries production. And what they found is that on average, sea surface temperature reaches a, a higher temperature about two, uh, about um, 15 to 20 days earlier in, in the current time than it did in 2000. So over 16 years, uh, um, the spring onset has moved forward about two to three weeks. And the consequence for that is, if you look here at the right-hand plot, on the, on the x-axis is temperature from winter time to summer time, and here's a measure of how fast these bugs grow, and what I want you to take away is the higher the temperature, the faster these Seneca cocks grow. That's not a surprise at all. But by combining these kinds of records of sea surface <coughs> temperature and the physiology of these organisms, we can say this is the reason why this, this particular species blooms earlier. And I want to, you to remember this plot, which was amassed over 16 years of sustained observation. So you have to remember that for about 35 slices. <laughs> we did some other experimentation with colleagues at the EPA where we manipulated the seawater uh, chemistry 
and said, what's the, uh, what's the growth rate of the whole phytoplankton community when we put every, well, everything together? Research has shown that if you manipulate seawater chemistry and you grow phytoplankton under different conditions, reflecting past, current, and future ocean, uh, ocean carbonate states, some species do much better, some species do much worse. And that's termed the winners and losers of ocean acidification. And we wanted to know, does the tide rise all boats and it somehow comes out in the wash do you get the same ecosystem production? Or is it, is it, uh, does it alter ecosystem production? And what we found, and I know this is way too small for you to see, but we looked at size groups of, of plankton from small, medium, and large. We looked at the growth rate. This dashed line is zero. The details don't matter. But what matters is that irrespective what carbonate chemistry is subjected to these two, large phytoplankton did well. They grew at, a, grew at a positive rate. For the others, this was kind of a mixed bag. And when we looked at the species composition in our final, uh, after seven days of incubation, diatoms, the large phytoplankton, dominated. It seemed diatoms like change. The chemistry itself doesn't matter. There's some reasons to, to expect this. But this gives us some suggestion that maybe these large diatoms that are associated with high production events don't mind an acidified ocean. But not only the base of the food web is changing, also the top. This is yellow-tailed flounder. We've observed a northward shift of this species because it is um, because it gets, it's getting warmer and it ha can expand its range in terms of the year-round presence. And these are landings reported by NOAA and NIMS. Other species of flounder are changing distributions as well, but this is not a temperature story. This is a fishery story. Here, the, this formerly very valuable fisheries has collapsed, and so fishing pressure has decreased, and now the species is occurring throughout its former range. So we have fish species changing distributions for different reasons. And this is the, the final plot of this detective story, which is really connecting the whole system. This is from Joe Willis, <coughs> uh, one of the co-PIs at Hui, and what he observed is on the top is a long-term record from 1930 to 2010 of uh, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. It's an index of the characteristic climates in the system, has a lot to do with the temperature. On the bottom, over the same time range, you have a measure of the isotope or the flash composition of haddock, a valuable fish species. And my four-year-old could tell you there's a high association between these two records. The key is we have no idea why these two areas are connected. But it tells us that the system is connected top to bottom. If we can measure changes in sea surface temperature in the flesh of haddock, there's a direct link somewhere. And that's one of the, ultimately, the goal we hope to um, elucidate with our long-term observations. I won't run you through the questions that we're asking, but we're really targeting the base of the food web, the forage fish, and the response of these components to environmental change. And our hypothesis is that flexibility in the components really imparts resilience to the system. So if the zooplankton aren't too picky about who they eat, then production can be transferred to fish. But if they're very specific in their prey selection, then the system will go under the massive fluctuations in its productivity, for example. We're taking a multi-pronged approach. We have sophisticated hydrodynamic modeling. The movie you saw earlier is, um, is, is one of those uh, resources that we use. We also build on theoretical ecology, where we compare the relative importance of the environment, the species, and the communities by doing targeted observations and manipulations. And as you can imagine, these kinds of models are data hungry. So we have sustained observations in the ocean, leveraging existing assets like the Martha's Vineyard Coastal Observatory and the recently deployed Pioneer Array and, and the, as part of the ocean observing system. These data, part of them are available in real time. So you could go to this 
very undigestible URL. I was trying to get a, a, something more accessible. But, uh, if you type that in, you could look at the sea surface temperature and other hydrographic characteristics right now. Heidi Susick has been maintaining the, um, oh, sorry, the, the IFCB data URL is obscured, but you could access this right now. And given the time of year, you would probably get lucky and see some large, beautiful diatoms in the coastal ocean of Martha's Vineyard. And these data are available to anyone, anywhere. We also have at sea measurements. And that's really a key to going beyond observations. We're really good at observation, observing conditions, but we're not very good at inferring rates of change from afar. So just because you see a high concentration of something, that doesn't mean a lot is going on. Or if you see a low concentration of something, a little is going on. So we have at-sea expeditions going from two or three days to, um, to multi-week expeditions that campaigns that go all the way throughout the LTR. And I want to show you some data from our recent and first cruise along this focal area shown in in yellow here, that's our cross-shell transect. And remember the talk, uh, the, the plot I wanted you to remember, where there was temperature on the x-axis and some property of this very tiny picoplankton going up. This is from a five-day cruise going from Narragansett Bay off to the shelf break. So going from onshore to offshore. And in these five days, we observed a tremendous temperature ra radiant and we observed a tremendous gradient in the abundance of exactly the same kind of phytoplankton. So this 16-year record over time is replayed here in a five-day record going across an environmental gradient. And I'm also just showing you the same data as a latitudinal gradient. So now we have this amazing opportunity, which we can't do with uh, passive observations in situ. Now we can make measurements of the transformations and the interactions amongst these food web components. And one thing we did was we measured the rates of growth and the rates of mortality due to herbivory of these individual components. And what we saw onshore, zero here means no change, positive means things are um, going up. Uh, sorry, I should take that back. Zero means no change. In terms of growth, negative means a decline in, in the biomass. So just like drawing more out of your bank account than your income, you can have a decline in the phytoplankton stock if the growth rate is negative. So what we're seeing onshore is the growth rate of the phytoplankton, which were really, really dense, was negative. They probably run out of nutrient, nutrients. And the zooplankton were taking advantage of it and eating at a really, really high rate. Offshore, the system was in a total different state. Growth was really high, but it was um, much more of these small plankton, and nothing was getting eaten. So we can make very specific predictions about where the populations are going and where the energy in the system is flowing. And this was taken on the Army Endeavor in, in January, and it was, I've probably spent several years at sea by now, and it was hands down the worst cruise I've ever been on. <laughs> and I said to myself, now I know that there's so little data from the, from, from the North Atlantic at sea. <laughs> we have great involvement of uh, students, postdocs, undergraduates. We uh, have a very thriving outreach program that focuses on teacher, uh, career building, teacher, uh, teacher interactions and motivations and curriculum building. And I think when we have these nice data series over years and decades, we will be able to contribute to managing the system by providing specific insights of how the components interact and how they might um, respond to both natural and human-induced changes. And this is a picture from that January cruise. <laughs> That's me on 5-7. This is Joel Locus. He's 16-something. And that wave is defying physics and gravity. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have a diverse array of collaborators led by Heidi Sosik and Hui, and um, uh, combined federal and, and academic researchers in multiple institutions. 
And with that, I want to thank you for your attention and taking the questions. Step up to the microscope and identify yourself. I, I'm glad I'm on schedule because this thing says 33 minutes and I don't know. So I'll ask the question maybe from over here. I'm Colette St. Mary. I'm a program officer here in Division of Environmental Biology. To what extent would you uh, suggest that those differences that you are seeing? amongst different um, water temperatures and the components of the system within each of those. Are the spatial patterns you describe, are they the result of those water bodies replacing one another, or is it changes in temperature in the same water body? So in, in the work I showed by Heidi Sussex's lab, that is change of water temperature at the same time of the year in the same body of water. So over time, if you go on March 6th, you'll find a water temperature that's higher in 2016 than compares to the beginning of the day. Um, what I was showing from the cruise is a fairly typical gradient of really cold onshore wintertime water and then going out towards the Gulf Stream. That's why we have this massive gradient. Um, so I, I was not telling a climate change story there. I was showing an environmental gradient. What I was hoping to convey is that by exploiting these environmental gradients, we can make deliberate, deliberate observations in, uh, in the space for time <coughs> replacement where we can say, okay, this is more typical of the beginning of the decade. What are the fluxes in the system? And this is more typical of a warm state. What are the fluxes in that system? Yeah, Dwight Gladhill, NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program. Uh, fantastic talk. I was wondering if in your observations you've been making, you've captured what I've heard is a loss of primary productivity in the Gulf of Maine in recent years, and what you what you make of that. That's such a long story. Okay. <laughs> Can you make it brief? So I measure chlorophyll for a living, and I have a lot of opinions about that. <laughs> and as a scientist, you know, five people in the room and you have nine opinions. I, I think um, there are two concerns about changes in the system. Um, I don't know if I would put a number on the decline. There's, there's no question, observing macroscopically, that the system and the productivity is changing. Um, whether that is due to chlorophyll concentrations declining, um, I, I personally am a rates person. So biologically, you can motivate any kind of occurrence. Predator and prey should correlate. Predator and prey should be anti-correlated. So inferring the state of the system from stocks alone, to me, is, is problematic to begin with. Was that evasive enough? <laughs> that was really suitably evasive. Um, but, uh, so I, 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 no, no. Well, I also wanted to reach out to you because you know uh, our program is actually engaged in repeated occupations of effectively your entire LTER every four years for ocean acidification work, and we are actually advocating and trying to get rate exactly that rate measurements as part of the survey. So I think we should probably um, be coordinating a lot more. Yeah. I think we, we have but stuff to get. There's no question, and I think rather than looking at the chlorophyll number declining, the bigger concern is that you could more of the small stuff. They could they could double the chlorophyll value. It would still suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> is there a question up here? So um, with seeing diatoms um, do better. I'm wondering, does silica ever become a limiting nutrient for them? I think very close to the coast, probably, but in the North Atlantic, for sure. 